We're going to be finding the domain and range of different relations. So before we do that, I'd like to do some review of mostly vocabulary that we have already learned, but also a little bit deeper into it so that we are fully ready to get into the domain and range. So I just want to start out with relation versus a function. If you remember, a relation is any set of ordered pairs. There doesn't have to be any specific tie between the input and the output. It is just a set of ordered pairs. Whereas a function is a special relation. For a function, every input, that's your x, has only one output. So every x is tied to only one particular y. The x's cannot repeat. This is very critical. It's also a real easy question to get right as long as you remember that for a function, x cannot repeat. So let's look at a few examples. Let's look at these tables. Who wants to know, is this a function or not? Well, when I look at this table, I'm, I'm really focusing on the x column. I can see here that negative 2 is paired with 3, negative 1 is paired with 4, 0 with 5, 1 with 6, and 2 with 7. I can see x does not repeat. There is not a, a, for every single input, there is only one output. So this is a function. Okay? Let's look at the. We are focused again on the x column. We want to make sure that x does not repeat. And right off the bat, I see that negative 2 is paired with 3, and negative 2 is also paired with 4. 2 is paired with 5, and 2 is paired with 6. The x's are repeating, so this is not a function. Okay? Here we have negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. It's looking good. x is not repeating. Notice the y column, though. Y is 5 every single time. This is okay. It's okay for Y to repeat. Only X cannot repeat. So because every input is paired with only one output, this is a function. Okay? And this last table, we have negative 2 paired with 5, we have negative 1 paired with 6, negative 2 paired with 7. I see that this is repeating, so I know that this is not a function. Okay, so with the table, simply focus on the x column, make sure that x does not repeat. Same concept here with a mapping diagram. With a mapping diagram, where the X's are listed in the left circle and the Y's are listed in the right circle. Now in a mapping diagram, we wouldn't list the number twice. What would happen is more than one arrow would be coming off the number to show that it's paired with more than one output. So we're not just looking, does the number repeat? Because it's not going to repeat. We're looking, is each number paired with only one output? And we can see in this first example, it is a function because every input is paired with only one output. In the second example, 1 is paired with 4, 2 is paired with 5, but 2 is also paired with 7. When we see this double arrow, two arrows coming off of one um, input value, it is not a function. This is not a function, okay? two is repeating it is paired with more than one output and then here this is similar to the example up here with the table where the y's repeat negative five is repeating as a y but no x's are repeating so that is a function so again we're checking do the x's repeat and with the table and a mapping diagram that's pretty straightforward i mean we're looking at the numbers we're checking to see if they repeat with a a graph it's not quite as straightforward but good news we have a method that we can use that uh, works very well the method is called the vertical line test the vertical line test and for the vertical line test you're going to take a vertical line I'm going to use this piece of paper you could use a ruler or the edge of a binder or whatever whatever you have available and you're going to take that vertical line and you're going to slide it from left to right across the graph. 
what you are checking is how many times does this line touch my vertical line at any one point so right here this line the graph is touching the vertical line in one spot i move it over it's still touching in one spot touching in one spot touching in one spot one spot one spot all the way through this uh, graph only touches my vertical line in one spot that means this is a function that means that nowhere on this graph are you going to find x paired with more than one y okay this passes the vertical line test let's go to the next one start my vertical line i start moving right here i would say okay it's only paired with one spot but immediately upon moving my vertical line i see that here and here on this vertical line this graph in more than one place if the graph touches in more than one place that means that there's an x repeating this is not a function okay if you think about it let's say that right here x is negative 2. if i was going to write points down i would say negative 2 is paired with let's say that's 2 and negative 2 is also paired with negative 3. so that is not a function let's test our next one start moving across i'm seeing it's only touching in one spot keep moving one spot 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 one 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 it never touched my vertical line in more than one spot so it is a function and finally we get this little piecewise function here I have a perfectly horizontal line. If I have a perfectly horizontal line, it's never going to touch my vertical line in more than one place, right? But look here. Now I have a vertical line. Clearly, a vertical line is going to touch a vertical line over and over and over and over and over. There's an infinite number of points on that line that are touching my vertical line. So this does not pass the vertical line test and therefore is not a function. So with the vertical line test, you're moving your vertical line across your graph. If it touches in only one spot, it's a function. If it touches in more than one spot, it is not a function. Okay? All right, now let's just review discrete and continuous. Discrete versus continuous data, okay? For discrete data, I like to call it distinct dots and i do that because discrete starts with a d and so does distinct and so does dots and that helps me keep it straight discrete is distinct dots and the reason that they're distinct dots and they're not connected is because there's no data between the points if we look at this particular example i have the number of shirts and the cost of the shirts it looks like if i buy one shirt it's going to cost me five dollars if I buy two shirts, $10, three shirts, $15. If I connect the line, then what I'm saying is there's some information in between these points. Okay, well that would mean I would buy a uh, one and a half shirts and it would cost $7.50. And, and that would be some data that we could look at, except for that, do we buy one and a half shirts? No, we don't cut shirts in half and buy half of a shirt. So this data is not part of the, this relation. This relation only consists of buying whole shirts for $5 a piece, okay? Um, that's important because you will have to determine if data is discrete or continuous. So you need to be able to tell it, it, what the difference is and why. Yes, I know that physically we could take a pair of scissors and we could cut a shirt in half, but we're not going to do that and that is also not how we purchase them. So I like to say, if it can be cut in half legally, morally, realistically, that's when the line's gonna be connected. And that's gonna be both variables. So continuous is connected. Here we go again with the C, C, can be cut. If both variables can be cut in half, again, legally, morally, realistically, then that is a case in which you're going to be connecting the line. That is going to be continuous data, okay? 
So let's look at this example. We have the number of hours worked and the amount of money earned. Let's say you go into work and you work an hour, you make $5. So this one is $5 an hour. Two hours, $10. Three hours, $15. But what if you work one and a half hours? Is it realistic to say for one and a half excuse me for one and a half hours, I need to pay be paid seven dollars and fifty cents? That's realistic. Working a half an hour is realistic. Earning half of five dollars is realistic. So what I do is I ask myself, can this be cut in half? Can this be a cut in half? Can you have half of a dollar? Sure, I mean, I'm not going to actually cut the dollar bill in half, but if I have 50 cents, I have half of a dollar. And can you have half an hour? Absolutely. I can stay somewhere 30 minutes instead of 60, right? So discrete is going to be distinct dots. That's because there's going to be no data between the points. Continuous is going to be connected dots, and, and that is because there is data. There's information that makes sense in between your points okay so that's a, a little review of discrete and continuous and the last thing i want to review is the definitions of domain and range we have talked about these definitions before i want to make sure we review them and that we're real clear on them the domain and the range the domain is every possible x value so if I am looking at the domain, I'm looking at what makes sense on the x-axis, okay? Remember our x-axis is our horizontal axis and it's our independent variable, it is our input. Our y-axis is our vertical axis and this is our output or our dependent variable. Our y depends on x and the range is going to be all possible y values all possible y values so if you're trying to find the domain and range the way that we're going to do that is for domain we're always going to move left to right so every single time we are going to be starting on the left side of our graph and we're going to be moving to the right looking for every single possibility that there is for that graph that particular graph for the range we will always be moving from the bottom to the top and we will be searching everywhere on the y-axis where there is information provided for the graph so let's kind of let's look back let's look at those two examples that we were just doing and let's talk about their domain and their range. We had the $5 per shirt problem, and then we had the $5 an hour problem. $5 per shirt problem was a discrete graph, okay? If we wanna talk about the domain of a discrete graph, we're gonna to have to list the points that work for that graph. Well, this graph only happens right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, and probably continues on with that same pattern, right? So just domain is my X values, and it goes from left to right, okay? Now let's just think realistically, could I buy zero shirts? Yeah, I guess I could buy zero shirts and it would cost me zero dollars, right? Can I buy one shirt? Yes. Can I buy two shirts? three shirts, four shirts. I can continue to buy shirts. Ooh, my little birdie was not so pretty right there. We use those little birdie brackets to, to write domain and range. So the notation we're gonna use when we're dealing with a discrete graph is listing the exact values that are in, that are possibilities in here, okay? So let's talk about the range then. The range, we're always gonna move from the bottom to the top. Is zero a potential cost? Yeah, if I buy zero, pay zero dollars. Go up, the next potential cost is five dollars. Then 10, 15, 20, and it's gonna continue 
to go up as you buy more shirts. Now, the three little dots, the ellipse, that tells me to continue with this exact same pattern. So for the domain, I'm counting by ones. I'm using only whole numbers, counting by ones. For the range, I'm counting by fives. All you're saying when you're talking about domain is this is where you will find this graph. This is where there's information pertaining to this problem. So if you go anywhere on the x-axis and you look for one of these numbers, you will find information. If I go look at the domain of negative five, let's say, I'm way out here at negative five, no matter how high I look or how low I look, I am never going to find a point that belongs on this graph. That is not a realistic number in the domain, okay? So when we're doing discrete data, we list the points because there's no data between the points. When we're doing continuous data and we're doing finding domain and range, we have to use a different um, notation. And that's because we're saying all these numbers, the numbers from here all the way up and every number in between the points is included. Well, I can't write every single number in between one and two. There's an infinite number of numbers. I cannot write them all. I cannot list them all. So for continuous data, we're going to use a notation that includes inequalities. So with domain, I'm always going to go left to right. I start over here at the left. The lowest spot where I see information is at zero. I move along, I move along, and I see, oh my gosh, there is a arrow. What does that arrow mean? That arrow means this continues forever and ever and ever. So if I go out to the left forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and ever there's still going to be graphs somewhere way up there. So I can't put an ending on it. I'm going to have to call that infinity. Okay, so basically what I'm saying is zero is the lowest number possible and it is also equal to zero. I can actually have zero hours worked. So zero is less than or equal to X because our domain is our all possible X's, which has to be less than infinity. Okay, and we'll talk more in detail about other ways you can write that but for the sake of consistency moving left to right we're always going to have the smallest number on the left the largest number on the right now our range we're going to be moving from bottom to top which again is going to be smallest number to largest number our range if i go down from the bottom and i move up the first place i find information is right here at zero and again, I see this arrow that means it goes on forever and ever and ever. So it's going to go to infinity. Okay. My range is my Y's. So zero has to be less than or equal to Y, which then again has to be less than infinity. The notation for domain and range when you're dealing with a continuous graph is going to include the inequality signs.